want to talk about the, the, the future of Europe in the world. Now, that's something which could be approached, of course, I mean, from uh, several angles. But the, the particular angle I'm going to, to use here is uh, the uh, perspective of power. Uh, the, the, the future of Europe's power and influence uh, in the world. Uh, you may call it the geopolitical perspective if you want. Uh, and uh, the, the starting point is that we may uh, distinguish a, a fairly small set of world roles of power of states or uh, state groupings uh, uh, of, of, of any kind. Um, first of all, I mean, we have the world powers. Nowadays, we usually call them superpowers, but that's a, that's a fairly new uh, designation which uh, came up during the Cold War. Um, and uh, among the, the world powers, we may distinguish between competing or rival world powers and a dominant uh, world power. Sometimes, I mean, there is one, sometimes there is not. Secondly, uh, we may uh, distinguish uh, regional powers uh, dominating a a continent or a subcontinent. And thirdly, uh, there are specialized uh, powers, specialized world powers. Uh, and here, for reasons which will become uh, a bit clear, I hope, later on, I will distinguish between economic powers and trading powers. And then we have uh, uh, three uh, roles which don't involve much power. One uh, we may call a global example, uh, which means a, a country or a grouping of countries, an area which doesn't have any real power in the world, but which might have some influence, which might function as a source of inspiration but also as a target of criticism. But a kind of global example out of proportion to its size and power. And finally, we have all the rest, the non-powers of the world, which of course are, are, are most of the, of the uh, countries. I will start by uh, 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 briefly bringing up the, the past, the past of Europe, because the, the past always leaves a legacy. Those of you who are historians are familiar with, with that. So, once upon a time, not that long ago, Europe was a set of rival world powers. That was the period basically from 1500 to World War I. Uh, if you want to, you could ex uh, uh, extend it, I mean, to 1945, but um, anyway, I mean, there was a time when, when European rule, uh, powers ruled the world. Largely based on navigational skills and, and naval uh, artillery. Uh, it was a kind of naval, naval uh, world power, or a set of, of rival world powers. Spain, Portugal, the Netherlands, France, Britain, uh, and later on for a while uh, Germany trying to, to get a, a, a part in the... Uh, today, because uh, uh, one of his legacies 
is a set of imperial reflexes among some states of Europe. You make it, uh, you, 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 you uh, notice it, particularly in France and Britain, but to some extent also in, in, in Germany and uh, less so in, 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 in Spain or... or uh, uh, you, and these imperial reflexes are sort of uh, 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 manifested in a in an almost constant spoiling for a fight. Uh, almost longing for making a war, a jolly little war, as Winston Churchill called uh, uh, colonial wars in the, in the early 1920s. So intervening in, in uh, various, various parts of the world. And even in Germany, you may remember that in the German uh, liberal press, or, and conservative press for that matter too, uh, when Germany could finally make war again, intervening in, in, uh, in Yugoslavia, uh, it was regarded as, well, hooray, I mean, Germany is now a normal country again. There you have this sort of the imperial reflexes coming up again, and it's, it's, it's still there in, in, in Britain, France, Britain and France in particular. Um, uh, there is another manifestation of this imperial reflex, which is the, the persistent but always failed attempts to create a European army. We have the most recent example, I mean, now after Brexit, um, uh, France and Germany are sort of raising the issue again of creating a, a European uh, a European army, which the British conservative press is, is laughing at. How could you possibly think of, I mean, building an army without Britain? Um, but anyway, I mean, that's the, that's the uh, uh, legacy of having once been a world power, these imperial uh, reflexes uh, of longing for foreign interventions and and setting the world right on across oceans and, 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 and continents. After this period of this long period, when uh, uh, Europe uh, made up, I mean the, the 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 powers of the world, there was a a much shorter period, but nevertheless quite. Uh, significant. The period of when Europe was a set of declining, retreating, and self-destroying former world powers. That's basically the period, I mean, from uh, the uh, end of, of World War I, which bankrupted parts of Europe, and where well, European dependence on American intervention became clear. So it was the American intervention in World War I, which settled, I mean, the European Civil War. This, uh, th this period of decline, retreat, and, and self-destruction during World War II, uh, we can date, I mean, from, say, from 1917, the year of the American intervention, to Suez, 1956 when uh, the, the last major imperial adventure uh, undertaken by European powers, the, the French, the Franco-British attack on Egypt in 1956, which ended in a, a complete humiliation. Uh, there is a wonderful uh, story told by the then uh, French uh, foreign minister, how uh, there was a meeting in Paris, Adenauer was in Paris to talk to Mollet about uh, the plans for a, a European common market, when there was a phone call from London, from the British Prime Minister, telling the Swiss attack is off. And the reason was 
uh, Eden had got the phone call from Washington telling him, I mean, you quit, otherwise you'll have to face the consequences. Which wouldn't have been an American military intervention, but <laughs> would rather that America would have cut off economic support of Britain. That was the end of, of the imperial period in, uh, in Europe. And that was the immediate background to the final uh, successful agreement of the Rome Treaty creating the, uh, the European common market, which was being planned but there was considerable resistance, particularly in France, uh, 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 to it. And uh, it can be debated whether it would, the treaty would have passed without Suez or not. But, but in the end, it, uh, it, it did and right after the end of European imperial power. But one could say that Europe in decline uh, got the new world centrality uh, of, of a new sort in the sense that Europe became the central battlefield of the Cold War. As you know, I mean, the Iron Curtain uh, 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 ran through, through Europe and the major flashpoints were, I mean, uh, around Berlin. So Europe was the, 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 the central battlefield of the Cold War, which was, a, of course, a, a global global war, but, um, and that Cold War centrality had another uh, enduring legacy uh, on, on, uh, on Europe, namely a, a European dependence on the United States and a European subservience to the United States. This subservience was sometimes mingled with resentment, which never, never got the upper hand. So, I mean, there was always, yes, sir, of course, yes. That kind of grimace, sort of, I mean, behind the back. Um, and uh, this is another thing, I mean, which has uh, remained as part of, part of, uh, the sediments of European history, this idea of subservience to the United States and dependence, but mingled with, with, with resentment to it. So that was the, the, uh, the past and its, its legacy. What then happened, I mean, was the, the regional reconstruction of, of post-imperial Europe which was, or which can be seen as the construction and the surge of a regional power. Um, but it's a, it's a somewhat complex and, 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 and uh, uh, contradictory uh, history with its own uh, particular legacies of, of, of problems. One of the most original uh, features of the post-war reconstruction of Europe was the creation of a normative area in Europe, a regional normative area. The American war hawk uh, uh, Robert Kaplan has talked, referred to this uh, 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 dismissively as a self-contained world of laws and rules, um, but anyway, I mean, it was a, a it was a, a heroic attempt to create a new world after Auschwitz, uh, a, a world of human rights, of, and of international law, and the first incarnation of this was, of course, the Council of Europe, set up in 1949, um, and is is still. Uh, uh, operating as uh, a watchdog of human rights in, in Europe. And there is a, there's a court of human rights. Um, and this kind of uh, uh, normativity uh, uh, has also been adopted 
by the, uh, by the market integration of Europe, the, the, uh, the European Court of Justice, the European Court, uh, managed, I mean, through very active jurisprudence, to become a, an extremely powerful transnational court. Um, and, and still is. Um, now, the, the, uh, the legacy of this, well, the, the, the normativity of, of Europe is still there, so, and something to be proud of, but it, it, it involves a certain problem, which is that it makes Europe an area of jurisdiction without any real social roots. And the, the kind of the, the tension between the elites uh, and the transnational regional elites and the national peoples, I mean, is to some extent uh, inscribed in this uh, um, legalistic um, framework. Then, of course, the, 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 the major thing was the economic integration, which was originally uh, a, a kind of um, planned economic post-war reconstruction, the coal and steel union, which uh, the French banker and adventurer Jean Monnet uh, designed. Um, And, uh, but which became, uh, with, the, with, the, um, with the Rome Treaty, and in particular with, the, with the, its extension with the Maastricht Treaty, became a li liberal project. It was a liberal economic integration, no longer a, a, a planned uh, economy like the one which, which governed the, 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 uh, the Montana Union, the, the uh, coal and steel uh, uh, union. And part, uh, a part of this, a very important legacy of this liberal focus, this uh, construction of a liberal economic Europe, was that the social Europe was left to national projects. Uh, which, of course, differed to some extent, but I mean, looked at from the outside, I mean, there, there, uh, there was a similar social development in, 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 in all Western Europe in the 1960s, 1970s, uh, driven by uh, forces of social democracy and of Christian democracy. Uh, but the, the, the point to be stressed here is that the, the economic integration became more and more a specifically liberal project. And the social Europe was left as separate sort of national, uh, national project. And the effect of this was uh, uh, the production of a constant and increasing tension between the, the economic, the market integration project and the peoples of Europe, which was expressed, I mean, in the, uh, already in the 1990s with the, uh, the difficulties the European Union had to get through its referenda on the Maastricht Treaty and the fiasco of the constitution of, of, of our Europe. I mean, the people uh, just said, no, I mean, we, we, don't, we don't see the point of this. So that was, uh, I mean, I, uh, a, um, the production of a, uh, a, a germ of what would come later as a problematic tension in, in, uh, uh, in Europe. But for the time being, 
in the, in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Uh, this was a very successful organization, the European Union, which became a regional power on the full scale. And uh, uh, successfully managed the, the integration of the eastern and western parts of Europe and powerfully dictating the conditions for membership. You have to do this, you have to do that, and if you do that, you, you won't be allowed in. So, I mean, it was really a... a, a uh, and and this, this kind of Europe became a, uh, an inspiring model of the world, inspiring ASEAN in Southeast Asia, uh, inspiring the... Uh, or actually becoming the the direct model of the African Union and inspiring Mercosur in South America and to some extent even, I mean, the NAFTA in, 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 uh, um, in North America. And this was the time in the early 2000s, just before the economic crisis, the financial crisis of 2008, that there was the, the apogee of, of European power and prestige and where several uh, uh, pundits and commentators uh, wrote books like uh, The European 21st Century or The European Dream Eclipsing the American One. It was particularly popular in, in the United States, uh, not only among uh, liberal ideologues like Jeremy Rifkin, but even also among uh, uh, radical people like Immanuel Wallerstein, for instance. I mean, uh, all of them predicting uh, a uh, uh, decline of, of the United States and the emergence of, of Europe as the dominant uh, world power. And uh, Europe itself became very ambitious. In the Lisbon Declaration of 2000, it declared that it, it aimed that within 10 years it would become the world's most competitive knowledge-based economy. So, well, that's the past. Because if we look at the, the present basis of the future, we'll have to conclude, I mean, that this was a passing moment of glory. And why, why did it pass? Well, first there was the, the economic failure. Uh, Europe didn't become the, the world's most competitive economy. And in, in fact, it's actually sliding in its share of world GDP. Before, before the latest financial crisis, it was about one-fourth of world GDP. Now it is about one-fifth. Whereas the United States has basically stayed put with only a marginal, almost unnoticeable uh, 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 decline. And China has, has risen as the unquestionably the second, the second world power. And uh, the rise of China, and then later on, I mean, the ongoing rise of India and of South Asia, is underlining that demography and demographic weight is coming back as, as an important economic asset and political asset. And here, of course, I mean, Europe is in, is in a very weak position. Uh, having declined from 13% of world population in 1965 to 7% right now, and after Brexit it will be uh, just under 6%. Um, and it's predicted to, to decline further, not dramatically, but, but nevertheless. I mean, it's, Europe is aging and it's demographically shrinking uh, in the world. Another aspect of the economic failure is not just, I mean, the, 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 the failure to become the leading uh, economic power in the world, 
It has also been a failure to manage the economic development inside Europe itself. Social tensions have risen uh, because of the unequal and uneven uh, development which we see in the rise of popular protests in almost all countries of, of, um, of Europe, uh, which, which has a number of causes and, and uh, is framed in different ideologies, but one, one of its fundamental roots is the increasing inequality between uh, 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 central cities and the countryside, between classes, between regions, uh, and, uh, and so on. And then there have been political failures, colossal political failures, which, has, which have uh, undone Europe's, uh, or the European Union's position as a regional power. Most important one uh, was the the, the failure of, of Europe, the failure and uh, unwillingness or the lack of courage to try to stop the American destruction of the Middle East. Uh, uh, turning the Middle East from Afghanistan to Libya into a seemingly permanent war zone, which is because the, the background to the migration push into Europe. Um, and uh, has, has led to the, the, uh, the migration crisis of, uh, of Europe. And, and, uh, uh, Europe also uh, made a colossal miscalculation uh, about the Ukraine and, and actually became, I mean, the power triggering the division of, of the Ukraine uh, by uh, pushing the, the agenda of, of Western Ukraine against the, the, the Eastern part. And, and this has led to a uh, seemingly endless festering crisis on the Eastern border of uh, of, uh, of the European Union and, and demonstrates EU's incapacity to act as a responsible regional power. And before that, I mean, there was even, I mean, the, the, it's, it showed its weakness in, in the war of Yugoslav succession. So, uh, summing up, uh, all this means that the, the world in which Europe rose to become a world economic power and a regional, major regional power is ending. That was the world of liberal globalization and regionalization, <coughs> which is now under... Uh, 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 the a world of liberal globalization and regionalization governed by an ideologically convergent liberal elite. All this is now being questioned by, by popular protests, by nationalist uh, 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 movements, and uh, uh, they this, these processes uh, are now in retreat uh, almost everywhere. ASEAN, I think, is the only example where it isn't, but uh, that's another uh, matter. And a, a large part of the reason why this uh, world of, uh, of liberal globalization come regionalization is ending is the inequality it produced the social inequality, and that this is now manifest and people are protesting in various ways, often in very confused and counterproductive ways, but nevertheless, I mean, this is what's happening. 
So um, then, what what are the alternatives of the future of Europe? I think there are three possible scenarios uh, which we can uh, uh, discern uh, for the time being. The first one is that Europe will maintain and assert its role as a specialized world power, as a trading power. Europe is still the world's <coughs> second largest exporter after China, and it's, it's a major trading bloc. Uh, and uh, it has uh, a tradition of having used this trading power in a lot of uh, treaties, uh, uh, and negotiations uh, uh, for rule-based uh, global uh, 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 trade. Uh, but uh, the, the prospects of this trading power, I think, are getting somber. The reason for that, sort of, uh, the European Union is now facing at least three crucial tests of power. One is the Iran deal, or rather, I mean, the, what to do with the, with the United States breaking, breaking the uh, painstakingly negotiated deal with Iran. Uh, the, the second uh, is the agenda of WTO change. And the third one is the, is the Paris Accord on, the cl on climate change. It's noteworthy that as all these three tests are, are created by American disruption by the Trump administration. And on the Iran deal, so, I mean, this has had the, the interesting effect that for the first time, I think, in its history, European politicians are trying to take the first small steps of independence. Um, they're trying to rescue the Iran deal, uh, creating a, what I call a special purpose vehicle, uh, a kind of a special payment system which would um, evade the American economic warfare against Iran. In a sense, that's laudable and so on. I mean, the, the first small steps uh, ever by Europe of, of doing something on its own, uh, uh, going against uh, its big brother. Um, unfortunately, I think the, the chances of this uh, e evasion of the American uh, uh, embargo on Iran uh, are, are slim. I mean, already the big European companies, Total, Siemens, and many others, have withdrawn from their uh, agreements with the Iranians of investments and, uh, and so on. And even uh, the Brussels-based um, European company, SWIFT, which is uh, organizing the electronic banking transfers, have, have said, no, we, won't, we don't dare to, to do any deals with the Iranians, because the Americans tell us not to. And um, I think it's, it's mo most likely, I mean, this kind of uh, special payment mechanism which the European Union is trying to, to push together uh, and which uh, originally, I mean, no, no European country wanted to host in order not to offend the big brother. And in the end, of course, France and Germany, as the two major powers of Europe, had to, had to say, okay, we'll do it, we'll, we'll, we'll do it. But uh, yeah, it's unlikely to, to become anything more than, uh, than symbolic. Uh, it will probably not be able to deal with the crucial oil um, uh, exports uh, of Iran. But it, it, it should be said, I mean, uh, and social scientists should be careful. We're not 
making uh, 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 too stiff predictions. The evidence is still out. I mean, some, a miracle could happen. Um, the, the issue of the WTO uh, is, more, is less clear-cut and more complex. Uh, but clearly, the, the Trump administration basically wants to get rid of all the rules of multilateral trade. Uh, there has been a compromise at the G20 summit of um, uh, modernization of the WTO rules. Now, what that means, I mean, nobody knows yet. The Americans will probably, I mean, uh, uh, drive for uh, uh, getting rid of uh, uh, any kind of, of uh, binding rules. Uh, Trump has actually threatened to leave the WTO if uh, complaints uh, against American protectionism is taken up by the WTO. Um, and the third one is the climate, is the climate accord, which the uh, European Union, I mean, tries to to rescue, but. Um, uh, this uh, 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 climate accord de facto, I mean, seems to be uh, primarily dependent on what China does or doesn't, doesn't do than uh, uh, what, what the European, Europeans do. So the conclusion of this is that, that Europe will probably fail its tests of power and will become a kind of a second-rate uh, uh, trading uh, area uh, uh, far away from the uh, centers of power, and of course, in the in the new world, Europe has lost its centrality of the uh, of world conflict, which has moved, I mean, from Europe to the South China Sea. So, uh, uh, in terms of in terms of power. And in terms of centrality in world conflicts, of course, it's a blessing in mixed blessing. Uh, Europe is being uh, marginalized and pushed out into the periphery. So then there is the alternative of Europe becoming a kind of a world example. And this is a, this is a, 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 a possibility and it's it's something which Scandinavia has some experience of and so on, because Scandinavia and perhaps Sweden in particular, but Scandinavia as a whole uh, has had that role in the post-World War II period and even for a while, even in the 1930s. Marcus Child uh, wrote his book on, 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 um, on Sweden. Uh, which is, a, a, as a world example, I mean, you don't have any power. You can't tell anybody, I mean, what to do. You can't threaten anybody. If you do that, sort of, I mean, we'll kill you, or we will sort of boycott you, or whatever. Um, and you don't even have, I mean, much power to negotiate, or to persuade people. But uh, by your very existence, you may provide a kind of inspiring example of a decent piece of world. And um, if you look at Europe in, in a, uh, sorry, yeah, uh, the European Union in a global context, you see that on a global scale, the European Union might be seen as a Scandinavia writ large on a world scale. It's the, it's the area in the world with, with least economic inequality, with least relative poverty, with the most generous social protection, with the largest public economy in terms of public revenue and public expenditure. Um, and it's also the, the part of the world with... Um, 
uh, the uh, uh, least inequality between men and women, for instance. So in, 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 in a sense, I mean, uh, this is something which uh, is within uh, the range of feasibility. But it's not without problems, and so on, and I, 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 I like to point to two of them. Uh, one is that uh, the European Union has itself, I mean, always perceived itself as a liberal project, as a common market, with then with some additions and, and kind of garnishments added to it. It has never really defined itself as a social Europe, as a social project. It's a project of equality, of, of uh, uh, social security, of social cohesion. Um, so that would require, I mean, a, a kind of reorientation of, of Europe, and for which there are few forces in sight for the moment. And secondly, uh, this position uh, as relatively decent part of the world is being undermined by ongoing uh, economic processes, like in Scandinavia itself, where uh, inequality has uh, accelerated over the last decades, particularly in Sweden, less so in the, in the, in the other countries. And inequalities are uh, accelerating in, in Europe as well. Uh, so it's, uh, it's problematic, but it's, I think it's the best hope uh, we can have, I mean, for a European position in, in the world. There is a third scenario which I should mention finally before uh, getting to the conclusion, which is that a, uh, Europe might become what, what, the world's Balkan corner, the Balkanische Ecke uh, der Welt. Uh, that would be that would happen. I mean, if the uh, nationalistic and xenophobic forces in Europe not necessarily come to govern, but but have a major major sway in 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 the European Union, that would mean a kind of a, 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 a an inward-looking uh, a Europe full of competing historical narratives. And, and rival weird ideologies, uh, uninterested in the rest of the world, and basically irrelevant to the rest of the world. Europe might become, I mean, a kind of promontory of Western Asia. Uh, so, uh, to conclude, even a long uh, monologue has its end, so, I mean, so. Um, I think we should recognize that uh, the European Union has demonstrated an impressive flexibility and resilience, contrast to many Anglo-Saxon uh, uh, predictions. It has handled the, uh, the Brexit issue masterfully, I think, in, in great contrast to what the Brits have done with it. Still an open question what will happen in the, in the uh, parliamentary vote today. Uh, so, the, uh, contrary to many uh, predictions, yeah, the European Union will not break up in the foreseeable future, but its role in the world is likely to diminish. Say that the, the, last, the last world flourishing of Europe was around 2000, around the, the uh, Lisbon Declaration and the uh, East-West uh, 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 unification. And its, its trading power is likely to be too weak to withstand, I mean, the brutality of the American onslaught. And um, the second, the second uh, uh, 
economic power in the world is now definitely China. Uh, and uh, that will not be crippled by uh, the uh, American warfare. But there, then there is, I mean, this, this, this option, which is not clearly on the horizon yet, politically, but it exists as a possibility of a social Europe as a kind of example to the world, as a kind of uh, a place of decency and a base for various humanitarian alleviations in a cruel world. Whatever that chance will be taken, that's an open question. Thank you.